yeah. So as Mark mentioned, my name is Carolyn, and I'm a front-end developer. I'm currently working at a company called Blacklane, and I'm also a Mozilla tech speaker. I'm currently based in Berlin, but I'm moving to Dusseldorf at the end of June. <laughs> Thanks. And I, it's really perfect to be here right now because I literally know nothing about this city besides what like Christian Schaefer has told me on Twitter. So, um, so if any of you are living here and I don't know, want to give me the inside scoop or maybe be my friend, you can just like find me later. That would be great. Okay, anyway, back to the actual talks. So it's important to note that before I was a developer, I was actually a technical writer. So this topic about documentation is very near and dear to my heart. And so today I'm going to talk about how we can make our docs more human friendly. And for the sake of this talk, when I say documentation, we're going to focus on external facing documentation. So the documentation that describes your product to its users. All right. Let's get going. Also, I'm going to hold this like a weird little microphone, so you can just ignore that. But all right, I want to start with a single question. Why do we even write documentation? Is it because someone told us to, like our managers or the acceptance criteria of our tickets? Or is it because we actually want to help the people using our products accomplish their goals? Writing documentation tends to be an afterthought and something that we just kind of like get done. But what if we decided to approach documentation with the same care and consideration that we give the features we ship? Those questions lay the foundation for what's now known as use case driven documentation. Use case driven documentation derives from the idea of goal driven documentation, both of which were coined and made popular by Tyner Blaine in 2006. And it works like this. Make your users goals the focal point of your docs instead of just describing interface elements from left to right. To illustrate why having goal-centric documentation is important, Tyner Blaine uses the example of a power drill. So they say that if we were to document this drill the same way that most document software, we'd end up with something like this. How to adjust the speed, how to change the direction, how to change the drill bit. So now you know how to operate a drill but not how to actually accomplish anything with it. These examples are known as reference docs. They're information oriented. They describe the machinery. And they're usually accurate and complete. But if we were to change our perspective and focus on what it takes to do the job and not just use the tool, we could turn out something like this. How to drill a hole in a flat surface, whether it's wood or metal. How to select the right screw for fastening items how to stir paint with your drill. Suddenly, the documentation is helping us to achieve our goals. And to begin understanding why this approach is successful, we need to think about that first question. Why do we even write documentation? And perhaps more importantly, we need, should focus and be asking, who do we write documentation for? And the answer is surprisingly straightforward, humans. Like, yes, yes, I know that with the development of sophisticated bots and AI, this answer could change soon. But for now, most software documentation is written with the idea that humans will read it. And humans need that kind of guidance that documentation is meant to provide. That's why those same principles from that drill example can apply to our products as well. Yes, we write documentation to teach someone how to use our software, how to work it, sure. But we also want to be teaching them how to achieve their goals and solve their problems using our software. So let's apply this idea to something maybe a little bit more applicable to our industry, say Slack. Because I know they have a developer portal, I crawled their sites for examples. Ooh, that looks horrible, but it's fine. <laughs> These were a few of the titles I found. As expected, we have those information-oriented reference docs. They teach us about making our messages interactive, how to subscribe to event types, and the differences between the event API and the real-time messaging API. That's nice, sure. But even as someone who uses Slack daily, I'm still not really sure why we would need any of these functions. So this is a screenshot from the same docs, just a different page. But notice how they're now not only giving us use cases, create simple workflows, build bots, 
but they're also outlining what we can accomplish. We can create that simple workflow by having our app respond to user activities, or we can build bots to automate tasks. Plus, they even point you to those reference docs that were from the previous slide. So now that we generally understand what use case driven documentation is, let's look at like a high level outline of this idea. When you want to develop a use case, you typically start with a goal. And then if you're using use case driven development or something similar, the rest of your workflow could end up looking something like this. You'll define the functional requirement, you'll design the product, and then you'll implement the feature. What most documentation is doing, however, is starting at this phase, the implementation. It's once you've already finished that feature, and that's OK. It works, like the docs get done. But what a use case driven approach is proposing is that we start here at, you might have guessed it, the use case. And the beauty of this is that you can design your documentation simultaneously with the features that you're developing. When we use a structured approach like this, we have an established framework for defining the problems that our software will solve. We articulate how to, prob how to solve those problems with use cases. And then those use cases define exactly what we need to document. So this is cool. It's a nice idea. But it doesn't usually happen like this, even with the best intentions. One of the problems with this use case driven approach is that first, like, it requires a fundamental change to how your team tackles documentation. Also, those reference docs, the ones that just explain what the software can do, those are actually why documentation has a pretty bad rep in our industry, because they're usually really dry, and they tend to leave us wanting more. I know this feeling well, for, because it's like when I was first learning JavaScript. And before actually taking a proper course, I found it really hard to learn JavaScript. It was literally like, what the hell is going on? Like, why is this so confusing? Nothing's working. And like, seriously, do people actually enjoy this? Like, I still wonder about that, even as a front-end developer. But I just kept running into documentation that made me feel completely deflated afterwards. You know, there were a lot of unexplained jargon, assumed knowledge, and most of the time, my questions were left unanswered. So this experience, plus feeling like slightly underappreciated as a technical writer, left me with the impression that Nobody actually wants to read documentation. Like, I certainly didn't. And <laughs> plus, it's true that people typically visit docs when they're frustrated with software or they're disappointed that they haven't been able to solve the problem on their own. Recognizing and validating these feelings are important because these emotions frame our reader's perspective and therefore should be shaping the mood of our docs. But now that I'm deep into the developer world, I also realize that this statement isn't entirely true. What I have realized is that people don't mind reading docs and may even be thankful for your docs, as long as they're actually helpful, or at least more helpful than they are confusing. But a lot of documentation isn't, and this is why it's still a huge pain point for many developers. If you just search the term like reading docs on Twitter, you'll notice that most of the tweets are not super positive. Here are some that I have found. So, hi, I was reading your documentation and you described this data in two different ways, which is correct. Thank you, the way it works is third completely different description. And Ethan actually told me that this was from a large organization, you might know them, they do a lot of work with like space. So just because your organization is large and you have resources doesn't mean that it magically gets better. Next one. Process of learning how to write a plugin, read docs, get console log output, read more, try literally anything else, get errors, read more docs, read existing plugin source. Notice it's written completely differently to what the docs say. Cry a little. I go through a similar process, except the crying usually comes like much, much earlier. <laughs> and this one's my personal favorite. Bad documentation is bad. And even after someone else asked, if there were no docs, would it be better? Lee still said, deep thoughts. Honestly, yes, because it would waste less of my time. So yes, people love to hate documentation. 
But that's because most of the documentation that they're finding isn't fulfilling their needs. Back when I was a technical writer, I also used to think that if I could only convince developers to care a little bit more, if I could convince them to care, then you know, they would think about how they craft their documentation as deeply as I did. Like I was some sort of like weird documentation evangelist that like no one asked for. But <laughs> again, now that I'm a developer, I know that this also just isn't always possible. Because even if a developer really cares, they're almost never going to have the time to think about things like comprehensive learning journeys or doc con like content architecture or debate over every little single word if their job title doesn't have writer in it. But there are like small tangible actions that we can take to improve our documentation. And that's what I really want to focus on during this talk. We can start by looking at the actual words that we're writing. So we want to make sure that those words are readable and optimized for comprehension. One blocker to this goal is insensitive language. And this one can be tricky because across like nationalities and personalities, insensitive phrasing or wording can mean a lot of different things. In this case, it includes like profanity or anything that might break a code of conduct. Take this one for example. If the programmer wishes to uphold the invariant, he must satisfy the function's preconditions. And now you might be thinking that gendered language is a relatively tame example. But even so, it can have really negative effects on the members of your community and their own sense of belonging. In software development, we also use these like problematic, outdated, and mostly racist terms that we're still using, even though it's 2019. Terms like master slave and blacklist whitelist. A good rule to follow is that when you're documenting code, don't make assumptions about you know, race, gender, religion, political orientation, or anything else that isn't directly relevant to the project. For the previous examples, we can use these alternatives. Primary replica, deny list, allow list. I've also heard that block list and safe list work pretty well. And not only are these like explicitly less racist, but they actually better describe their purpose via their semantics. But there's so much more than these four words, and I can understand that it's a lot to think about. So I have a linter for you. AlexJS catches insensitive, polarizing writing in your markdown files. You can use it on the command line or as an integration with Atom, VS Code, or even Slack. Um, it's also open source, so if you notice that it's not catching something that you think it should, you can just submit a pull request. Here are some of those examples from earlier, but now AlexJS is helping us catch those words that are better left out of our docs, as well as suggesting helpful alternatives. So you should probably still have a human read over it, preferably someone not from your same demographic, but this is a pretty good start. Next, saying simply or easy in your documentation. So Jim Fisher actually opened this year's Write the Docs Prague conference with a talk on this topic. At one point, he searched for the word simply on GitHub and found 92 million references to the word simply in documentation, which is wild, like if you think about it, because if you've been stuck on a problem for a really long time, like do you really want to go and read some docs that are like, oh yeah, this is really simple? No. <laughs> what we can do is ban isolating words like easy, simple, obviously, etc., from our documentation. This is already common practice for people who are working as technical writers, and we can learn from these practices to be more mindful of the words that we're choosing. If you're struggling to find alternatives, Jim Fisher, who I just mentioned, has some suggestions for you. You can be more specific. So maybe your product is easy because it's quick to set up or doesn't require much configuration. If that's the case, just say so. Or you can be comparative. Something is smaller than something else or requires fewer steps to create. You can also be absolute. It takes five lines of code to integrate this with your, product, with your project. When you suggest being absolute, lots of times people immediately jump to time as a indicator for how like easy something is. You've seen it, like 
launch a website in 10 minutes, build your own server from scratch in 30 seconds, like, et cetera. And if this is the case, um, it's recommended to show and not tell. So if you really think it takes five minutes to set up your tool, I would challenge you to make a video and see if that number still holds. Jim does that in his talk, and let's just say it proves the point. If you want to enforce this rule, you can also use a different linter. So WriteGood is another linter for English pros. It's available as a command line tool, and someone recently wrote a VS Code plugin for it. Once it's installed, you can run this command to do a general check of all your markdown files. It automatically flags for words like simply or easily, and you can write a custom check for other problematic terms that your team might use frequently. So for instance, I know a team that just wrote one for the word just, and maybe I need that too, because I use it all the time. OK. The next one might be the most common. So often what I see in documentation is that it'll be filled with these like long, verbose like chunks of text that are filled with bloated language. And by this, I mean overly complicated prose that are difficult to understand for anyone, but particularly those who might have a learning disability or who aren't reading in their own native language. We want to choose our language intentionally for our documentation, and using plain language is crucial for more inclusive documentation. One tool that we can use to make sure that our language isn't too complicated is Hemingway Editor. So here you can paste your text in, and it'll highlight problematic words and phrases for you. It mainly flags like long, complex sentences, uh, unnecessary words, or words with a simpler alternative. Uh, the main downside is that it uses color to distinguish and the mouse over event to distinguish these fields. Um, you'll also almost never satisfy it completely, and that's really okay. What's important to note is that on the right-hand side, there's this like readability score. And we want to keep that down to a maximum of a grade eight. And don't worry about readability ever being too low, because as the great Ashley Bischoff once said, no one has ever complained that something was too easy to read. Unexpected errors are another common issue that people face. And while we can't necessarily prevent this through our documentation alone, we can make it better by considering and addressing common errors if you know them. So this helps to reassure to your users that mistakes will happen. And it also gives you a chance to offer suggestions for troubleshooting. When you're writing about these errors, try to explain what might happen and why, and then tell the reader what to do next. This is a screenshot from the Apple II basic programming manual from, yes, the 1970s. Uh, but it tackles the nuances of common user errors quite well, and even explains syntax errors before you code. This tells us what happened. We got a beep and its syntax error message, why we press return, and what to do next, ignore it. When you're formatting these errors into a tutorial, Django Girls is a great resource to reference. These notes are scattered throughout the tutorial, and the clear formatting allows it to be informative to those who will be running into these errors, but also not distracting for those who might not be. I've also seen like collapsible error messages work pretty well. And finally, when it comes to our writing, you might just be in too deep. Like, imagine you work for hours and hours, week after week, on this to build this product. You become so familiar with it to the point that you don't even cognitively recognize the core concepts as you work with them. And it's easy to forget that those concepts aren't universal. So then, when you go to document the product, you forget to take that step back, and you write the docs as if you're talking to yourself. But the problem is, is that first-time users won't have that same frame of reference. And so any unexplained term or skip step in the process can completely destroy that learning journey for that user. What you need to remember is that like, no matter how intuitive you think your tool is, or how advanced you think your users might be, Everyone starts somewhere, and everyone is a beginner at some point in time. <laughs>
What I found to be effective is to go through the entire process from start to finish and talk out loud while you're doing it. At the same time, maybe have another colleague who ideally isn't from the same project as you. Um, take notes about what you're doing and point out where things might be confusing or unclear. Next, I want to touch on something that's probably equally as pre like prevalent as words, and that is code. So code snippets are understandably very common in documentation. So we should give them just as much care and consideration as the words we write. I'll start by pointing out that code snippets should never be screenshots. This is for accessibility reasons, sure. Without alt text, the code is unreadable. Um, if you're using assistive technologies. But logically speaking, it's much more in your favor to write out the code. This way, people can copy and paste to try things out or even interact with your code if you have some sort of playground embedded in it. As an alternative to screenshots, we can follow semantic HTML principles and use a code tag for inline code. For instance, if you're mentioning like a specific function name within a sentence. Then if we want to expand that into an entire block of code, we can use the pre-element. That way, the text is formatted exactly as it's written in the HTML file. This is what's being used if you use those like triple back ticks on Markdown. And speaking of Markdown, code blocks are part of the Markdown spec, but syntax highlighting isn't. Um, however, some renderers like GitHub, which is very common, um, do support syntax highlighting. All you have to do is write the language name after the back ticks. And if you go to this cheat sheet, you can see a list of the languages it supports. Another note that I learned the hard way is to watch for trailing spaces, because some screen readers will literally read like space, 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 if you have those extra spaces after your code. And this is annoying, yeah, but it's also important because especially because some programming languages, like the spaces are indicating the necessary formatting for that code. Another issue that pops up a lot in code snippets are these like nondescript variable names. This is because like foo, bar, baz, insert three letter word here, like they have no context or any sort of indicator for what they could be representing, which means that our readers are more likely to lose their understanding. Instead, we can use meaningful placeholders and use those as a tool for teaching. In a discussion about this, Ellie, a developer based in London, once said, we can have variable names that are both meaningful and generic that expose their purpose via their semantics. She uses the example of an array, and I want to dig into that a bit further. So here's an array named Baz with two items, foo and bar. So say I'm learning, I'm just learning like what arrays are and how to work with them. These variable names are way too abstract. So instead, we can name our array something like list of fruits and call the items apple and banana. And we don't even need to take it this far necessarily. You could also even name the array something like array name and list item one and item two. It's not the most creative necessarily, but it's still promoting comprehension much better than those indescript variable names. So now that we've covered like the literal words and code in our docs, I also want to take a step back and talk about maintaining our documentation, whether it's individual articles or the overall doc app. Structure and hierarchy are essential for this. When you work as a technical writer, typically like the first thing you learn is that well-structured content is the best foundation for great documentation. Sounds nice, right? But again, it's usually more of like an ideal than an actual reality. But it's important to consider because the structure of our docs like shapes the learning journey and the overall experience for our readers. We want to have a clear, easy to follow structure. So when you're writing an in doubt, you can aim for something like this. You can talk about one specific feature, go on to explain the use cases, and finally then offer solutions for tooling, integrations, etc.
this covers all of your bases. You have information-oriented docs that explain the feature. You have goal-oriented, like showing use cases that could either maybe inspire your users or address their needs directly. And then you can suggest other tools that can lead the reader to what you think they should be seeing next. Beyond writing, we can also think about the accessibility and structure of the page itself. A good question to ask yourself is, would someone be able to quickly scan this document and understand the material? Using subheadings to differentiate sections or breaking sec like text into short logical chunks, it helps both sighted users and anyone using assistive technologies to consume this page. But if we're considering how accessible this is, then we also need to ask another question. Is the markup clean and structured? So Laura Kalbag, who's the author of Accessibility for Everyone, describes well-structured documentation, or sorry, <laughs> well-structured HTML as the secret weapon of accessibility. And that's because when we write well-structured HTML without altering the default behaviors, our page becomes naturally accessible. And because documentation is largely text-based with very few interactive elements, if any, it's the perfect use case for semantic HTML. Even if you're using GitHub or some sort of content management tool to publish your docs, it's important to understand what the semantic output of that markdown, rich text editor, whatever you're using, is. Then we can make decisions about how we structure the content based on that. Some like totally random examples, um, if you're using markdown, is that the greater than sign followed than some text translates to a block quote tag or using three or more hyphens or underscore translates to in a horizontal rule tag. I'm not really sure why I chose these ones, but I think it's just because it's not like a list or a heading. Manuel, who I believe is also here at this conference, wrote a nice article about writing, accessibility, or writing, ugh, writing HTML with accessibility in mind that I've linked here. Um, to name a few examples, we can use one, h1, heading one, tag, to describe to the user what this page is about, or a nav tag to clearly indicate the start and end of our navigation bars. And a side tag can indicate the content that's secondary to the main material, like a sidebar with additional links, or we can use the lang attribute to help define the natural language of the document. And essentially what I've learned at least the past couple months is that um, even if you think you know HTML really, really well, you probably still have a lot to learn. Like, there's probably so much more that you could learn about it. Another way that you can also examine the page structure without even diving into the code is by looking at the unstyled view. This is roughly the way that it would be read by a screen reader from top to bottom. How we structure our docs is also important because it can dictate how someone navigates through each page, especially if they're using a keyboard. We want our focus as a user to follow the visual flow of the page. Another win that doesn't require too much effort is to add a skip link to the beginning of your docs. Skip links are internal page links and are mainly used by screen reader users for bypassing or skipping over repetitive web content. They're not usually vis visible on the page because sighted users can just scroll right past it. I'm mentioning them as a final note to structure because they can set the tone for how someone interacts with your docs. To illustrate what I mean, let's take Twilio as an example. This screenshot is super old, and now the Twilio docs are much more accessible. But you'll notice, like, and this is very common for a lot of documentation, they have a huge menu bar, because usually there's a lot of information that is available in your docs, hopefully. And you'll notice that when we take away the linked style sheets, there are a lot of menu elements. And it takes a lot of time to get to the main content, especially if you're using a keyboard or a screen reader. By adding skip links, we can help with this. And the MDN web docs are a nice example. They have three main skip links, uh, skip to main content, select language, and skip to search. 
For the last bit of this talk, I want to call attention directly to accessibility, and I think Charlie set me up well for this. Um, I've mentioned it a few times already in this talk, but I feel like it's important to explicitly say that this is important for documentation. Mostly because if we're trying to make our documentation more human friendly, then all humans should be able to access and read the materials. And the thing is, is that while some people have realized the benefits of accessibility for their products, it usually ends there. Like, documentation is left completely out of the conversation. And that's a big problem. Because if documentation is meant to serve as a tool for learning, discovery, and comprehension, then it needs to be included in those conversations. One excuse that I hear frequently is that documentation is for developers. And this statement is problematic for many, many reasons. But let's start with this statistic. One out of every 200 software developers is blind or hard of sight. And this will probably be the only time you see me quoting the Stack Overflow survey. But if we think about how narrow the participant set was for that survey, we can imagine that there are probably so many other people that were not accounted for in this. People who are probably trying to read our documentation. Take Free Code Camp contributor Florian Byers, for example. He was born blind, but he's able to code using a standard issue laptop. He wrote a blog post where he explained that inaccessible docs and tutorials were one of his biggest pain points while learning. He wrote that the tutorials were undoubtedly good, but were completely unreadable for me. Then goes on to explain some of the details that those who wrote the documentation might have missed. And to put it bluntly, like this is our responsibility as people who are writing the documentation or designing the pages for the doc app, even if we're not the ones writing the code. Ann Gibson, an independent accessibility consultant, puts this really well. She says, we may or may not be responsible for writing the HTML, but if the developers we're working with don't produce semantic structure, then they're not actually representing the structures that we're building in our designs. So whether you're an engineer, designer, information architect, or something in between, you can have a hand in making your docs a little bit more accessible. But how do we accomplish this? I've mentioned a few ways already, and I want to leave you with a few more tips about improving your, how accessible your docs are generally. But of course, if you want to dive deeper, you can feel free to find me later, or you can join the Alley Club on Wednesday. OK, promotions aside. But <laughs> we can test our documentation for accessibility the same way that we might for our products. There are many free extensions and validators that help automate accessibility testing and scan for errors on our site. I'll just touch on two of them. First is Axe, which is an open source rules library for accessibility testing. It was designed to enable developers to automate their accessibility testing. It lives in the dev tools, but don't let that intimidate you if you don't want to go there. It's, it's basically just pressing a button. And when you analyze the site, it comes up with issues, the number of occurrences, the element location, and some suggested fixes. Or if you want something more visual, WAVE is a web accessibility evaluation tool developed by webaim.org. It provides visual feedback for how accessible your site is um, by injecting icons and indicators directly onto the page. So yes, this video is super old, just ignore that. <laughs> has the old Slack logo. But once we activate Wave, it highlights these elements. In this case, our navigation and our header. We can see that our images have all have alt tags. And then it can point out any potential issues. In our case, one of the links may not make sense out of context. We can also create and implement an accessibility policy specifically for our documentation. So this can be anything from a formal document that you publish in your doc app um, to an internal set of standards that your team follows. Either way, this should be a statement that outlines your organization's or your team's intentions towards your documentation's accessibility.
Oracle has a really nice example of this. So they have a dedicated documentation accessibility statement where they give warnings about things that screen readers might get wrong. For instance, they mention that the conventions for writing code require that a closing brace appear on an otherwise empty line. However, some screen readers may, may not always read a line that consists solely of a bracket or brace. Again, these don't always have to be made public, but posting them publicly shows your commitment um, to accessibility by letting visitors know what they can expect and also being able to contact you if something's off. You can also host an accessibility hackathon specifically for your docs within your organization or community. Um, there's a lot that actually can be accomplished in just a few hours. So MDN did this back in September, and based on the blog post that they published about it, which I've linked here, it seems like it was a success. So I hope that I've given you, I don't know, like a new tool or something to update your existing documentation checklists. But before I get off the stage, I want to leave you with one last thing that I learned during my time as a technical writer. So back in the days, I was working at a company called Contentful out of Berlin. And when I first read through their style guide for documentation, something immediately struck me. And at the very beginning, it says, we aim for accuracy and consistency. And I was like, yeah, OK, sure. Like, this is the case for most documentation, at least hopefully. Um, but what really got me was what came next. More importantly, we aim to be honest, helpful, and human. Honest, we communicate the pros and cons of a solution because in doing so, we build trust. Helpful, we want our users to succeed because their success is ultimately our success. And human, we want to feel familiar and approachable because after all, like you and anyone else, like reading or writing your docs are humans too. Thank you.